It's time to say goodbye. Mario Maker 2 is just around the corner and with its release, Mario Maker 1 will go into its well-deserved game retirement. But before we allow Mario Maker 1 to finally sit down in a park and to feed birds, let's push it once again to its absolute limit. Today, we're going to take one final deep dive into Mario Maker's crazy quantum loading shenanigans. We will take a look back at how some of the craziest Mario Maker contraptions worked. We'll take a deep dive into how Mario Maker actually works below its shiny surface and we will finally answer the eternal question. Does a muncher exist if nobody looks at it? But we're not only taking one final look at all those tricks to say goodbye to Mario Maker 1, because there is a good chance that a lot of those tricks are still going to work in the sequel. So you ready? Let's do this. Okay, so let's start by talking about how entities get loaded in Mario Maker and how to make use of this. So here, our poor little plumber finds himself in the middle of a boss fight against Bowser Jr. Everything appears to be quite normal. Jump three times onto Jr.'s head, don't run into the ouching shell, don't touch the hot fireballs. Business as usual. Or so Mario thought. But in truth, this boss fight is far from being an ordinary encounter. Because as soon as Mario leaves the small area in the middle of the room and crosses one of the fateful track lines, the whole arena starts to collapse. Oh no, it looks like Mario has to defeat Bowser Jr. here without ever leaving the small corridor in the middle, while the heir to the Koopa throne is allowed to use the whole arena. That's not fair, but even though everything here is rigged against our hero in a pantsuit, he still manages to beat Bowser Jr. against all odds. Now he's finally able to leave this area with the key that Bowser Jr. dropped. That is, um, if I hadn't forgotten to actually put into Bowser Jr. Hooray! Okay, so how did all of this work? Well, it's actually surprisingly simple. The only thing we need to make this collapsing boss arena work is this muncher on tracks. Yep, so it's time for a couple of Mario Maker 1 loading experiments. So here we have a super simple setup to find out the exact timing when objects get loaded. We simply have a shell mat on top of a spring. As soon as this block gets loaded, the shell starts to travel and destroys the block at the top. So all we have to do is to slowly move Mario forwards. And once the shell starts to travel, we know how many blocks off screen are loaded in advance. And hooray, the shell hit the block. If we mark the spot where the camera is at, once the shell activates, then we can see that objects get loaded as soon as they are no more than four blocks away of the current camera border. With this knowledge, it should be pretty obvious how our super unfair boss arena worked. There is one muncher to the right and one muncher to the left. Each one at such a distance that they only get loaded as soon as Mario crosses the line. Once they load, they start to destroy the ceiling. And this, ladies and gentlemen, directly leads us to a first universal principle of unseen muncher behavior. A muncher exists as soon as it is no more than four blocks away of the current camera border. Super simple stuff. But there is actually a lot more that we can do by exploiting the loading orders. See, the thing is, objects that are within the enemy entity limit simply don't exist before they are loaded. Let's do another experiment to prove this claim. So, First things first, items only despawn after they are more than 16 blocks outside of the current camera border. We can see this here. This shell destroys exactly 16 brick blocks out of sight and then magically disappears. This means that items that got loaded stay loaded for quite a while, even when traveling through unloaded areas. So check this out. Here we just copy the area from before, but we swap out all the brick blocks with bullet blasters. So if we now activate the shell, then the shell actually pulls off the impossible and bravely travels through all the blasters, hits this brick block and then falls into this hole. What a hero. However, if we run to the right and then back to the left before we activate the shell, then the blasters got loaded previously and the shell isn't able to magically traverse solid blasters anymore. This little trick is incredibly powerful. We can use it to test when a Mario has entered an area before, or we can test from which side Mario approaches an area. Here, for example, we have a setup where a power block gets activated when Mario comes from the right, but the power block doesn't trigger if Mario approaches the area from the other side because once the blaster that blocks the shell is loaded before the shell and once it's the other way around. This directly leads us to the second and third principle of unseen muncher behavior. First, once a muncher existed once, it exists until the camera is more than 16 blocks away. And second, a muncher that hasn't been loaded 
doesn't exist. Okay, so that's enough basic loading stuff. Let's talk about advanced loading stuff next. Let's take a look at global ground and global loading. So Bowser's space base just shot down Mario's spaceship and he crashed onto a hostile and mysterious planet. He lost all his power-ups, he has no way to communicate with the space engineering toads back at home and his only chance to ever get a chance to rescue his princess again is to explore this foreign planet. After a bit of exploration, Mario finds this area deep below ground. There is totally a Chozo statue that carries an ancient relic that is Mario's only chance to escape, because this ancient relic would allow him to reach the planet's exit door. But how should he reach it? The path towards it is blocked by a black bullet blaster colored door and the path to the right is blocked as well, this time by a red door. Hmm. Mario obviously needs to find a mechanism that opens up those doors. And would you believe it? There is actually a door opening question block hidden in this cave. All that Mario has to do here is to hit his head against this question block and hooray, the red door opened up. This path leads our mustache wearing space plumber to another door opening device. This time it is colored black. So if everything worked out, the path towards the totally Achoso statue should now be open. And it is, empowered by the power of this very powerful ancient headgear, Mario is finally able to leave. Alright, so how do we open up doors on the other side of the level by hitting a question block? Well, let's do a quick Mario Maker experiment. So here we have a very similar setup three times. Once we shoot a shell outside of the current camera border on normal ground blocks towards a question block that is more than 16 blocks away. Once we do the exact same with the only difference that the shell travels on top of platforms on tracks and then we do it a third time. But here the shell travels on top of fire bars. We'll run this experiment twice. Once we'll load in everything before shooting the shells and once we'll shoot the shells into an unloaded area. Okay, so first let's simply shoot the shell and see what happens. The shell that traveled on top of the fire bars behaves as expected. It despawns before it is able to reach the question block. The same happened to the shell that traveled on top of the ground blocks. No surprises here. But the shell that traveled on top of the platforms on tracks didn't despawn. Weirdly enough, this shell refused to disappear and actually hit the question block. Strange. I wonder what happens if we run this experiment again, but this time we load in everything before the shell starts to travel. So let's take a look at the results. Once again, the shell on top of the platform reached the question block. Once again, the shell on top of ground blocks didn't and once... Well, wait a second. That's weird. This time the shell on top of the fire bars was able to trigger the question mark block. Okay, so what's the solution to this little riddle? Well, the reason why the shells behave differently depending on the ground they are traveling on is because some ground is global ground. For some strange reason, there are three surfaces in the game that never unload and that keep everything on top of them loaded. It's fire bars, but only if they were loaded once. It's items on tracks and weirdly enough, P-switches that spawned from a question block. Every item that is on top of one of those three surfaces never unloads, not even when it is away more than 16 blocks from the current camera. The only way to unload those objects is to completely reload the area by walking through a door or a pipe. Let's add this to our little list, since this conveniently also is the fourth principle of unseen muncher behavior. Once loaded, a muncher on global ground doesn't cease to exist until it leaves the global ground. Hooray! Okay, so that's the first knowledge puzzle piece that we need if we want to understand how our doors from before worked. The second puzzle piece is that all entities in the ground block entity limit are always loaded, no matter whether we preload them or not. Let's quickly prove this. Here we have an ultra simple setup. We simply have an explosive bob bomb and a muncher that drops onto this walking boom bot, a couple of nasty coins and a goomba. If we approach this area from the left, then the muncher and bob bomb load before the coins and the Goomba are loaded. So let's load in the explosion and see what happens. All the coins got affected by the explosion from before and fell down. Meanwhile, the Goomba is doing fine, even though he just was in the middle of an explosion. The reason for this is surprisingly simple. The Goomba didn't exist when the Bob Omp made his boom thingy, while the coins were there, even though we never preloaded them. Coins live inside the block entity limit and all items inside of this limit are always loaded. That's brick blocks, block blocks, cloud blocks, donut blocks, ground tiles, coins, question mark blocks, ice blocks, spikes and most important of them all, 
donut blocks and invisible blocks. So that's where stuff becomes a bit complicated for a second. Let's say we have an invisible block behind a bullet blaster. Then it is impossible to trigger the invisible block because the bullet blaster is on top of it. If against all odds we somehow still find a way to activate the invisible block, then the blaster wouldn't be able to load anymore because then a solid block would be spawn blocking its spawn. So this is where it becomes complicated. If we are far enough away from the blaster, then the blaster isn't loaded anymore. The blaster literally only exists if the camera is close to it. Invisible blocks, however, don't share this quantum property. They always exist. What this means is that we can send a shell on global ground towards the blaster that isn't there currently and have the shell trigger the invisible block behind the absent blaster. If we now go back to the area where the blaster should be and load it properly, then the blaster can't load anymore because the invisible block is now visible. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how the doors from before worked. Once we trigger the question block, this setup activates a shell on top of the stage. Now the shell simply travels on top of global ground towards the blaster that blocks the door. There it hits the invisible block and hooray, the evil door blocking blaster can't spawn anymore. Okay, so that's the basic loading stuff and the advanced loading stuff. Time to take a look at the really bonkers tech. Let's talk about entity limits and how to manipulate them to our liking. Let's best start with an example. Here a plumber finds himself in the middle of one of Bowser's many castles. But what is this? The path forward is blocked. Oh no. Hmm. But wait, that's strange. This bullet blaster isn't firing anything. Oh, I see. This blaster is linked to a Goomba switch. This Goomba is the key to activating the blaster. All that Mario has to do here is to kill the walking mushroom and hooray, the blaster activates. Next, our mustached hero has to make his way through an empty corridor before he becomes entrapped in this room with three question blocks. But what is he supposed to do here? Ah, I see, that's a combination lock. All that Mario has to do here is to hit the three question blocks in the right order and the exit opens up. But what if we hit a wrong block? Well, if we hit a wrong block, then the pipes at the top suddenly decide that they are filled with hungry chain chumps and our poor plumber gets eaten alive. How ouching. But that's really Mario's fault for not paying attention. The hallway up to the combination lock showed three Bowser statues a couple of times. All that Mario has to do is to hit the three question mark blocks in the order the statues showed him earlier. It's the smallest one first, then one in the middle and finally the biggest one. And hooray, the exit opens up and no chain chomp pipes become activated. Alright, so how are we able to activate pipes when Mario hits the wrong question block and how did we wire a blaster to a Goomba? Well, we do it by clever manipulation of the entity limits. Time for another experiment. So here we have three question blocks that contain munchers. We can load the game, hit them, the munchers pop out, everything is fine. However, if we approach this area from the left side and hit the same three question blocks, something strange happens. They don't release anything anymore. We can do the same with blasters and pipes. Here we have two blasters that shoot munchers and pipes that spawn Goombas. Everything is fine when played normally. But if we approach the area from the side, then suddenly the pipes stop spawning and the blasters stop shooting. To make everything even weirder, they start to behave normally again once we hit this P-switch. At first glance, this may look a bit strange, but there is actually something surprisingly simple going on, hidden off screen, that explains this little riddle. Basically, we load in 100 Goombas at once and place them on top of a single off-screen firebar. Since firebars are global ground, the 100 Goombas don't despawn when we leave this area. Mario Maker stops to spawn new enemies once the in-game enemy limit reaches 100. Since we loaded 100 Goombas on global ground, 100 Goombas are permanently loaded and therefore the pipes can't spawn, the blasters can't shoot and question blocks can't release their content anymore. Only if we defeat the Goomba, new enemies are able to spawn. This is where the P-Switch comes into play. There is simply a coin placed behind our 100 global Goomba setup. Since coins are always loaded, they also always turn into brick blocks, no matter where in the stage they are. So as soon as we hit the switch, this evil coin becomes an all right brick block that kills all 100 Goombas and frees the entire entity limit. That's how we wired the Goomba to the blaster before. Here we just loaded exactly 98 items globally into the in-game entity limit. Then the Goomba and the blaster loaded, which brings the limit to exactly 100 and therefore prevents the blaster from shooting. If we now defeat this poor Goomba switch, then one spot becomes freed again, which gets immediately filled by the shell that the blaster shoots. This finally leads us to our fifth and final universal principle of unseen muncher behavior. A muncher inside a spawnable object, like a question block, only exists if there are less than 100 enemies loaded. Hooray! But this still doesn't explain how the combination lock from before worked. 
Well, to understand this, we have to quickly talk about donut overflowing. And this is where all the different things we discussed so far beautifully come together. The thing about the in-game enemy entity limit is that a couple of things count towards it that don't count towards the limit while building a stage. The limit during stage creation is the limit A, while the entity limit B or short ELB during play follows different rules. Doors, for example, take a spot in the ELB once loaded. Cannonballs shot by cannons too. And most interestingly, Donut blocks do as well, but not ordinary donut blocks. Only falling donut blocks count. As soon as a donut block drops down, it takes up one spot in the ELB, and this spot gets freed as soon as it respawns. So, if you want to make use of this, then all it takes is 20 good forms, 20 helpful fire bars, 20 dumb coins, and 60 donut blocks. All that we have to build is the following setup, and to load it in once, then the ELB immediately becomes filled. Here's how this works. Each womp and each fire bar count as one entity towards the ELB, which brings it to 40. Then there are 60 donut blocks. Since a womp is permanently on top of them, they permanently drop down, and therefore permanently bring the ELB up to exactly 100. The fire bar ensures that the womp is permanently loaded. The donut blocks are in the ground tile entity limit, which means they're always loaded as well. In short, once we load this contraption in, the ELB is permanently filled in our stage, but the creation mode entity limit is only at 40. Once again, we're able to place a coin behind the forms to immediately free the whole ELB as soon as a P-switch gets triggered. So this is the setup we used to make the pipe spawn chain jumps as soon as we enter the wrong combination. Basically up there is a quickly hacked combination lock contraption that triggers a power block if the combination is entered correctly and otherwise it triggers a P-switch. If a P-switch gets triggered, then all the donut overflowing forms we loaded in before disappear at once, which allows the pipes to spit out biting dogs. That's the whole trick. So there is actually much, much more possible in Mario Maker by using its loading algorithm, but those were the most basic concepts of Mario Maker 1. And hopefully, most of this stuff still works in the sequel. So to finally answer the question from the beginning of the video, does a muncher exist if nobody looks at it? Well, if it is less than four blocks away from the camera, yes, otherwise no, except it stands on a fire bar, since this is global ground, but only if the fire bar got preloaded before, otherwise it's no again. If the muncher lives inside a question block, then it does exist, as long as the block isn't more than four blocks away from the camera, otherwise it doesn't, except the LB value is currently above 100, in which case it doesn't exist until the limit is cleared, and if the muncher is on a track, then it doesn't exist until it is loaded for the first time, but afterwards it always exists. So the next time someone asks you this, now you know the answer. Hooray! And with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this little video. If you did, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and maybe you feel especially hyped for Mario Maker 2 and want to hit the subscribe button as well. I hope that all of you have a wonderful day and to see you soon. Goodbye!